Welcome to Shop Talk Live, episode number 273. We have a little bit of a different episode for you today. This episode was recorded on the show floor of IWF in Atlanta, the International Woodworking Fair. It's a woodworking fair where vendors and manufacturers get together and show off their latest wares. Most of them are industrial woodworking machines, but of course, we go there and try and hunt out the cool things for you, the fine woodworking and Shop Talk Live audience. This episode is an interview with Adi and Joe of Shaper Origin. Adi is a engineer at Shaper and Joe is the CEO of Shaper. It's a really interesting discussion. We hear about the early days from Joe as he first invested in Shaper and helped get everything going. And you can tell how excited Joe is about Shaper Origin and all of the different products and things that they're adding to the Shaper universe, if you will. For the record, this episode is sponsored by Shaper, but everything Mike and I say in this episode is absolutely genuine and true. We wouldn't be saying it otherwise. We always try and do sponsored content in a way that serves you, the audience, and in a way that we can be truthful about it. And just so that you know, Mike didn't even know it was a sponsored episode. <laughs> so everything he is saying is 100% true and from the heart. So without further ado, I bring you a pretty great discussion with Adi and Joe from Shaper Origin with me and Mike Pekovich. Um, all right, so we are here at the Shaper booth at IWF, and we're here with Adi, and you are a... I am a product lead at Shaper, yeah. A product lead at yeah. Shaper, and you've been working very, very hard on something that we're going to talk about. Yes. Um, a new software offering that happens today. Yep, today, yep. And we're also here with Joe, who it turns out is the CEO... That's right. ...of Shaper. That's right. So, like... Did you have nothing better going on than to do a <laughs> podcast with us? Like, <laughs> I love being here. I mean, this, this is, I'd rather be here talking with people, talking with customers, showing off our wares, uh, getting it out there. I mean, this is what we live for, getting it into the world and, you know, watching people's reactions and, and yeah, how, how seeing our babies have, live. How long have you been with Shaper? Uh, I've been involved, let's see, I've, I joined Shaper in 2015, uh, it had started just a little bit before. I actually, I guess rewinding a bit before there, I had gotten involved uh, on a kind of an advisor and angel investment level as, after I had met the founders, Alec and Alan, uh, and kind of helped them get this out of a prototyping stage and you know into something that could be commercialized. And then I liked it so much and I really liked the potential for it and the mission we were on and uh, saw, the, saw the real potential for what it had uh, had to offer. And I happen to be a hobbyist, uh, quite enthusiastic hobbyist woodworker. Uh -huh. And I was just instantly attracted to, you know, this is the right blend for me of uh, blending what humans can do really well with what machines can do really well, where I didn't see that there needs to be such a polarizing, you know, the machines are taking over, but like, you know, where, where can we get the best of these worlds? So yeah, yeah I jumped in, uh, with both feet or head first or whatever in 2015, I've been there about seven years or a little more than seven years. So when I think of Shaper, I think of like slick engineering and like refined look. What did it look ooh, like ooh, when you- Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> well, what, did, what, what was the Shaper like seven years ago? Uh, pretty crappy. Okay. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> nah, so, sorry, Alec and the line. No, I, you know, uh, look, when it first started, it was, it, it it was and still is a really good idea, and uh, they did what good prototypers do. At first, it was uh, kind of make the prototype as, as uh, high fidelity as it needs to be to prove the point and move on to the next one. So they were in a rapid prototyping phase. Uh, Alec had first invented the concept and kind of the idea of the kind of recognizing where the machine was relative to the world based on these, you know, technical term was fiducial markers. Mm -hmm and proved it out in one axis. And you know, if he were here, he'd be, he'd be telling you that he's very proud of the fact that he's you know, not a mechanical engineer, not mechanically inclined software person, but really proud of how he was able to cobble it together, like hook the 
camera together with hose clamps on sort of this, you know, 80-20 extrusion. And, and, but guess what? Proof of concept made yeah. it work. Proved, proved out the theory was correct and quickly re recruited uh, his co-founder, Elon, who is actually an extraordinary machine builder and very talented uh, mechanical engineer and inventor. So they made a good tag team. So actually, uh, I was joking around a bit. It wasn't that crappy. Uh, it was pretty sophisticated, but definitely not you know this this end consumer product that yeah. it is now. Yeah. So, so how many people were working with Shaper when you came on? Um, there were three, no, four full time people. I think I was the the fifth full time person to join the team, and pretty quickly grew the team from there. Uh, brought brought along you know some people in my in my network uh, and kind of my past life, and mm -hmm. we, we kind of kicked things in high gear. Pretty quickly found awesome people like Adi to join the team and uh, really help grow our potential. So I think, you know, at first, I would say the first core product that, which was Origin, rewinding back in time, it's now been on the, on the market for um, uh, four plus years. That was, you know, there was a core group of people, about 10 people that really brought up that hardware and software. And, uh -huh. You know, now, Today, fast forward, and, and worldwide, we have two offices, one in San Francisco and one in Stuttgart in Germany, and we're about 70 people now. Okay. Yeah. Wow. So it's not, it's still a smaller group. Still quite small, yeah. Really? Okay. Yeah, small but mighty. <laughs> yeah. So, Adi, how long have you been with the company? Uh, I just completed five years this year. Okay. Yeah. And w what did you do to start off? Yeah, so I, I actually started at Shaper as a mechanical engineer. Uh, yeah, I used to be, I mean, I did engineering design before Shaper at Apple. Uh, did a lot of product design on, on laptops there. And then also hobbyist, woodworker, hobbyist maker, really like making stuff. And as soon as I saw this, you know, it was like very personal to me. Uh, I spent a lot of time in school teaching shop class and sort of like knew the issues with CNC and how hard that is to get into. And so I was like really personally motivated by that, and yeah, came came to the company, uh, came to a I think it was a demo event maybe at Shaper one one evening, met some people, and I was like, yeah, I always tell people I like got interested in Shaper because of Origin, and then have stayed because the people are amazing. It's just like some of the smartest people I've ever <laughs> been around. So yeah. So when I first thought of like CNC, I think of a machine that moves with great accuracy and precision. And this, you know, when it first came out and people were trying to describe it, they said, well, you can do something really inaccurately by hand, but it ends up super straight. Uh, I mean, would you say, is that like the core competency of what this machine does? And then everything from there is like, okay, once we know how to do this, what can we do with this capability? Yeah, I think so. That's, that's maybe a good way to characterize it. I mean, we... Describe it a bunch of different ways. I guess in the, the, that kind of gantry example that you're talking about, like moving with great accuracy, we kind of we, we sort of pull the accuracy out of the, the, the gantry, we, and you know we make the human into the gantry effectively. But what we do is focus on that that like that last bit, so uh, or that that last millimeter, I guess. Mm -hmm. And um, so you can kind of we like you to get close to what you're trying to get, but we have real-time motor control, real-time kind of understanding of the position and motor control to get you exactly on that path. So that's, that's kind of our, our magic sauce there. Did that technology, was that in existence and you just applied it to this? Or was that things you sort of had to figure out to make work? Yeah, this is, this is going back to, I think, the, the core invention that Alec had originally come up with. I mean, I think, you know, in, in broad concept, it's a, it's a reasonably understood kind of academic uh, notion of okay, this is sorry, this is getting a little bit nerdy, no, but cool. the no, we're, the, we're nerds. So okay, right cool, cool, cool. Well, I mean, so you know, this this thing that you see out these dominoes, they're called shaper tape, but it, it, I guess you know, in the computer vision world, these are known as fiducial markers. And so, you know, broadly speaking, understanding uh, world position based on fiducial markers is is a reasonably understood concept, but it's never really, as far as we know, had been applied to this type of application of you know, processing this image at hundreds of frames per second, uh, actually thousands of frames per second, and understanding its position, and then using real-time motor control to actively move the cutter 
to the position that it needs to be, kind of anticipating where it needs to be based on where it understands what you're trying to do. So um, no, it hadn't really been done before, especially in this type of application. So I'm curious, and maybe it's possible you two have different answers. Is Shaper a tool company or a technology company? Curious to hear what Joe has to say. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, it's interesting. I guess, you know, the easy answer to that would be both. Or, yeah. uh, but I kind of think of us as a human-involved robotics company okay. uh, where we, we sort of live on the edge of, of again, I think, of, like I mentioned earlier, kind of trying to understand what machines and technology can do really well, but also recognize what humans are capable and are capable of doing really well. And you know, for example, like it's relatively easy to ask any even untrained human, hey, can you move this from here to here and you know get it like reasonably close to what I was asking you to do. That's a pretty difficult job to you know program a robot to do that. And so why not try to marry those things together? So a lot a lot of like what we do, especially in, in the combination of hardware and software, is looking at that, that kind of intersection. But you know, as applied to the lens of like how, how do we like for other people to think about ourselves, I, I kind of hope that our customers don't really think about us as a technology company. I hope they just think of us as, you know, we make these amazing tools and products, tools also meaning software tools that are so intuitive and just kind of the way that you would naturally maybe the way that you would design tools yourself or expect tools to operate yourself, that you could approach them and just use them and the technology gets out of the way. And so uh, but I the, sort of the, don't like the, to be considered a technology company. The tech has to be really good. It's so good. Yeah. To do that. Absolutely. That's, yeah, yeah, that yeah. is, you know, like a, a well-written piece of software yeah. just works right. the way you think it's going to work. And uh, the Shaper does that yeah. because of the technology. Yeah, no, thank you. So, no, that, that's that's so the good. best compliment we can receive. It's just like, it, and it, it is true. I mean, anybody who's ever tried to, I mean, that is kind of the the, the real truth is that uh, it takes a lot of sophistication to make it not appear sophisticated. Yeah. So I, I think I was going to say something similar. Like, you know, I think the word human is really important to me. I would say, sort of human first tool company. Okay. And the technology lets us put the human first. You know, the goal of the tech is to melt away and put user experience first. So a, we're really a tool company that puts user experience first. That's great. And that, yeah. yeah, that's cool for you to say that. I just So we're at IWF, which if you don't know, they have machines here larger than my entire shop <laughs> yeah. that do things amazingly, accurately, and automatically. In fact, I have to stand behind a piece of plexiglass at a computer control thing. Yeah, it'll take you out. Never operate it. <laughs> so there's this completely non-human interface. Yep. And then there's like a traditional table saw company. You go there, and that's like a person moving a piece of wood through a saw. And to me, this feels like that critical intersection of the human element leveraging that robotic technology in a way which is still offers a ton of creativity and human interaction with what you're doing. It's, For sure. Yeah. It's, I think internally we use the word augment a lot. Okay. And I think, you know, it's definitely the goal is to augment human capability. Yeah. Wow. Again, the humans are the center and all we're doing is helping you get the job done faster, more precisely, better, easier, do more. You're the Iron Man suit. Yeah, I guess so. Yeah. <laughs> so, Mike, this is your first time like hands-on with a shaper. Yeah. And it turned out the CEO was was telling me, <laughs> yes, it was, it was like this guy who's just like super excited. Come here, do you have any? Let, let me show you this. And I'm going like, Sorry, well, I, I gotta come and do a podcast. I don't. It's like okay. And it's like, um, yeah, being able to get a glimpse into it. My understanding of this product is probably akin to a lot of people who know about it who haven't used it. The first thing is like. This thing does this, and your first response is, 
no, it doesn't. <laughs> and then you talk to someone who's used it and they say, no, it does. And then the next thing is, okay, it does that. It follows this line really accurately. Okay, but like, what do you do with it? And that was sort of a little bit like where I came into this. And then just talking with you, Joe, over what, 10 or 15 minutes, and just the lights went off continually. You know, things you were showing me that I was just spent a week teaching with a regular router and jig and figuring out ways to do things, you were like saying, oh, this can do this. And I'm going, okay, well, how do you make sure it's even with the top? And like you did it the exact same way I did it. And it was just like, wow, this is, yeah. And so it brought to mind that, okay, once this product is invented, it seemed like your efforts then were like, what do we do with this? Like, what can it do and what do people need done? How did you walk that path? Yeah, I mean, this is maybe the perpetual challenge. I mean, one of the things, I think I was mentioning this to you earlier, is that, um, you know, this thing's really capable of doing a lot, uh, almost too much. And uh, I, I think from a communication standpoint, that gets pretty difficult. We've learned that that's pretty difficult of like, hey, this is a Swiss Army knife and you can do anything you want. And like, trust us, it's gonna slice your bread too. And you know, whatever you want it to do. It's not very helpful for people to like actually imagine how it helps them in their life. That's why one of the reasons I really love trade shows like this is uh, for exactly the reason that you mentioned before. Like, yeah, you kind of saw it, but like, yeah, I don't believe it. I mean, my favorite thing to do is like, cool, I, I also don't really believe it or didn't really believe it, but come over here. Get hands on the tool, let's just try it. I mean, feeling, seeing is believing. And so, you know, if I could give everybody a in-person demo, it only takes about two seconds on the tool for the light bulb to go, like, I, I get it. So I think coming back to your question though, you know, like how do we think about, uh, I think you were asking like, how do we think about like what to show, what to develop? I mean, for us, it was really important, I think, rewinding in time. We started small, uh, we knew that Origin would be this foundational product that we needed to get out in the world. The hardware has re remained the same, very stable. We continue to introduce new uh, functionality over time with over-the-air software updates. And I can't count, I think we're at nine, nine or 10, you know, system updates since we I, had launched. Yeah, I release I now. Okay, yeah, yeah. Do, do, do. I can't do the math that fast, <laughs> nine, 10, anyway. Uh, and um, we're just very, I think, considerate in the approach of, uh, we pay a lot of attention to, back to the human part, we pay a lot of attention to what our users are either doing well, not doing well, understanding well, not understanding well, what they're trying to do, what they think it should be able to do. And um, yeah, spend a lot of time observing and, and developing from there. That's really where we've now grown from this foundational product to really building the system up around it. So, um, and uh, you'll have to pull me back if I go too far on this tangent, but the system kind of started building out and recognizing, okay, great, we've got this thing, it's really capable, really versatile, but it's almost too open-ended what you can do with it. And there's an observation like, hey, the sweet spot of using this is in kind of a lot of bench top applications about the size and shape. I'm, up my hands that nobody can see. Uh, but uh, this kind of led to the birth of a, of a really killer accessory for it called Workstation. And we consider this, I mean, we, we for years have called it the complete system where it, this is like, you know, peanut butter and jelly. They have to go together. And really an extraordinarily high percentage. If you own Origin, you own Workstation. And like people have just figured that out. They kind of designed to work together. Can, can you quickly explain Workstation? Sure. Workstation is a, uh, imagine a, Kind of well well built, solidly constructed. Talking like you know, kind of, kind of a uh, uh, you know, cast cast and machined aluminum and uh, solid. Actually, how did you describe? Yeah, so the, I would the, call it a, a router stand that lets you clamp work pieces vertically yeah. and do stuff to them. That's right. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. I thought you, you had a good name for that before of like what you would have called that in your shop. I was like, oh, we should just call it that. Birdhouse? Do you call uh, it or uh, uh, well? And something about the clamping face. There was a name for it, but we call that the front datum. That okay. we that we. Yeah, that's, that's the. We nerdy. call that the front datum. Yeah, yeah I don't call it that's, that. That's no. the nerdy name. I liked yours better. I'm gonna rewind. By that. Uh, 
Anyway, uh, yes. I think I came up with that name. <laughs> so, oh, see, <laughs> date to me. Le- leave it to Adi. Actually, Adi was Adi was one of the primary developers on that product. And uh, yeah, so it's really focused on getting back to your question, Ben. Really focused on a couple of things. One observation of for a long time we really focused on kind of flackets, things you would normally think about with CNC, like hey, there's a plywood sheet and we're cutting holes in a plywood sheet, and then we're like, holy cow. You know, actually, Origin has this superpower that's actually quite difficult to do on even, you know, huge and awesome CNC machines, which is vertical, vertical, you know, end grain work really, really easily, precisely, accurately, and, you know, just quick setup. And so we really focus on that. So there's very high accommodations on workstation for vertical work holding and clamping and adjustable angle face for doing things like mortise and tenon on on table legs, for example, you know, just to Mm -hmm. give an example. There's also another aspect of it, if you move away from the vertical work holding and focus on holding pieces horizontally, there's an adjust, we call it the shelf, an adjustable shelf that easily uh, unlocks and moves, you can freely move it up and down, position, you know, let's say you had a table apron that was longer and extending uh, I'm sorry, extending, okay. I'm, I'm waving my arms around, <laughs> lock down, uh, and you can pretty easily position this in place, lock down that, um, that shelf, and go to town and, you know, create the mortises in that, in that for example. So, really, again, highly versatile workstation, um, really focused on fixturing, especially difficult to fixture things, right? really taking the like watching people be creative with how they're manipulating and trying to use Origin and saying like, hey, why don't we help people do this really well? Interestingly, and this is, this is I think it, it's been here the entire time, but I think it really emerged during the development of Workstation is that way before we sold uh, Workstation as, a, as this you know, highly engineered and manufactured product, we gave away plans for Workstation on Shaper Hub. So you could, we give away plans that you could build this out of plywood because you know, we recognize pretty early on that people like to do this. And they're still up there and people still do it today. So this is, this is kind of developed into an ethos where uh, it's, it's, it's not an official stance, but I think almost everything we do, we develop and give away a free version of it and encourage you, like, go ahead and do it. But we'll also try to develop the best instance of that uh-huh. that we can and hopefully earn the, well, earn, you know, the, the business of people who are like, you know what, I value my time a lot to get this well-engineered one, and I want to, you guys, man, you really considered all the tricks, the features, you know, the precision engineering, the way this, like, exactly moves precisely in place. I'm going to focus on that. I'll spend my money, buy that, get it done so that I can go and build, you know, my beautiful furniture or whatever it is that you like to do. Um, so we give it, you know, we, we still give away the plans for workstation. So that workstation is cool and understandable. It's a direct analog to how I might do things without this. Yep. Um, and then it's like you're saying, okay, here's a new product, and you showed me this kind of plate with a <laughs> hole in it. <laughs> that literally, literally a plate. <laughs> that was the full name. And the, yeah. And it was See, like plate with, with a hole, hole in, in it. it. Yeah. You're, you're on the like, product okay, naming here's team a new now. Product. I'm going. <laughs> Okay. They, they did not consult me on that one. <laughs> yeah. But fundamentally, conceptually, what you're doing with that is really sort of allowing it to do a lot of other functions than it was previously able to do. Yeah, right. So it's just it's kind of continuing this path of the system build out where this, you know, we describe plate, that is actually the name of it now. We describe plate as the universal template for origin. So this is again a lot of like just sitting back and observing how people like to use it. In fact, some of these things are hidden in plain sight. We're like, for years, even in some of our early marketing videos, we had, uh, you know, internally, but also watching customers, people have pretty specific needs for surgical application, for, uh, you know, kind of localized features. So what I'd say that, I mean, that's a bunch of words, like localized features, <laughs> surgical precision. But uh, think about, it, like, you, you need... Instead of on a bed, you know, a CNC bed, a lot of times you just need that precision right there on that yeah. piece of cabinet. We're doing the drawer pull or doing 
the hinge or doing the corner rounding or doing the inlay into the floor or whatever yeah, it might like, be. Like inlay into a floor yeah. is probably the prime example. So yeah. for, for people who don't know, who because this, this is coming out on Friday, uh, this is hmm. Tuesday, it's yeah. been released. It is a plate with a hole in it. We got that far. <laughs> but it is a, like a really precision highly milled like or milled maybe yes or no but yes it feels like if anyone ever had an apple g5 that side yeah. that oh, side yeah. plate that came off nice you compliment know, to, 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 yeah yeah yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah it feels like that's big solid chunk of aluminum and it's got you know of course that's satisfactory feel but then there's like these would you call them reticles that come fold down in the middle of the hole in the plate in order to give you basically a precise bullseye of where to put it right. if you want. Well, yeah, that's one of the things. So we've got a couple of things. There's, that's the name, reticle. So that's one of the things that deploys, yeah. pulls down, and think about a crosshairs. You yeah. know? And so, you know, again, one of the observations we had is like, look, the digital workflow is really great and we focus a lot on making that not scary, not intimidating, making it more human intuitive, the digital workflow, but there's also the world that we operate in, especially in woodworking world, there's a lot of analog components and really not, these aren't bad things, these are good things. These are like hard earned tricks, techniques that people have developed over time. So things like pencil marking and what that means to you and what that means to your eyeball compared to you know, your eyeball of that mm -hmm. particular marking, it actually means a lot. And so uh, observing that, this is this I think plate is a really good example of where we like to blend together the physical world with the digital world, but do it in a maybe more human intuitive way, where instead of like a forced thing like, hey, you gotta go learn this digital workflow, it's like, well, learn enough of it to be capable on this, but why don't we take a lot of the techniques that you've been doing for the last three decades and make them useful here? Yeah. So, you know, the reticle example is a good one because a lot of people just, you want to install a feature in X marks the spot, or you know, mark your thing right there. You know, the example that I was showing Michael earlier was, let's say you had a slab, and you, you, you had this crack in the slab, and you wanted to install a bow tie or a series of bow tie to stitch this together. You know, that's not something you actually necessarily need, you know, very precise X, Y coordinates, but it's more like an eyeball thing, of, yeah. like where you'd like it. But, it's good, you pencil it out, you draw it like here, I wanna put it exactly here at this angle, at this mark, and deploy that reticle, slap it down. You, it's a one-time setup, you do that, you know, do the operation, cut mm -hmm. it, and then you pick up plate and you move it to the next spot and you do it without doing any of the other necessary, formerly and necessary steps. the machine steps. thinks it's in the same place. And the machine thinks it's in it's, the same place. it's referencing off of the Plate. The exactly. dominoes, the, the on dominoes the plate. are on the plate. Yeah. So the machine is just going, oh, do it again. Yeah, that's Do it right. again. Yeah. And that's it. So we have a few things like that. So reticle is one of them. We have a few other uh, kind of very precise mechanical indexing features that, that help to do a bunch of other tricks. Like we have on the left and the right side, we have uh, uh, two sets of what we call side flags that. I think deploy is the word that I've been using, but they kind of flip down, nice little snap to them. They flip down, and it's easier to show than to describe, but basically think about aligning to the edge yeah. of a table, right? Aligning to the left edge. And then we have similarly, similarly a front fence that kind of from underneath deploys and becomes a reference fence that's at the, the very front, like closest to your belly edge of that table. So. For example, in deploying both those systems together, we can very accurately align to the to a corner of a table, for example, mm -hmm. and then from there, clamp it in place. With it comes with these, you know, custom designed included clamps. Clamp it in place, uh, release the fence back into a position that's safe for cutting, and then cut a corner on that table. Then the really cool thing is you can pick that up that same setup, and again, it thinks it's in the same place, move it to the other corner, or the other three corners, and finish out that operation. I mean, this is all in a matter of, you know, five minutes that you're doing that operation. Well, with, with any good jig, you know, repeatability yeah. is the essence of it. And we always try and, 
you know, no matter what tool you're using, you always try and work in reference um, fences or, you know, a reference face. And this is the same thing. It is, it's taking, like you said before, it's taking woodworking technology from 100 years ago. Right. And just applying it to cutting edge technology, yeah. <laughs> you know? Yeah. So, uh, yeah, it's, it's definitely one of those um, play at first. I saw it. I was like, okay, it's a thing with a hole in it. <laughs> yeah, right. And then there was like all these little things that came down. And it just, it really became obvious to me that it is, it's, it's a do all jig. Yeah. I mean, what I, I liked about it was that there was a logic to it. It's like you said, here's a plate, here's a hole. I can put this anywhere I want and do something. I'm going, well, how do you align it? Like click, click. Here's the side alignment. Boom. Here's the front alignment. Okay. This is cool. That answers all that questions. And it's like, what if I want to do something in the middle of a board, not aligned to an edge? And you go, okay, I got you covered. <laughs> here's a pencil line, pull it out, line up, and here you go. So the logic, it isn't like, here's one thing that does five things. All those things are, there's a logical order to what a woodworker needs to do, and you've anticipated that and answered those questions. So it was always this, what about this, this, what about this, this? Then it's just like, bam, I can see a lot of things happening with this. Yeah. So. so you stumped them. Yeah, well, no, I'm, I'm yeah. excited. Yeah, <laughs> but I, you know, I think I think there's something to that in that it's not just coming back to that word technology. It's not just technologists developing technology for technology's sake. I mean, most of the people that work at Shaper are active users of these tools, yeah. and not just because I have a gun to their head and tell them that they no. I mean, they they're doing things. I mean, one of one of the perks of working at Shaper is unlimited shop time with a fully built out shop to build projects and we supply materials and just go to town. We want people to build things, not even necessarily with our tools, we just want people to be active woodworkers and they are, I mean, we kind of naturally attract that kind of thing. So the development is not just, you know, an engineer, not only an engineer, a lot of us are engineers, but not only an engineer, but we have people who are very skilled furniture makers, cabinet makers, uh, Andy, somewhere over working the crowd. I mean, he flew in from Switzerland. He's out of our German office. He's, you know, a, a trained mas trained and master joiner. And, mm -hmm. you know, a lot of the, the new things, like, you know, what you see, a lot of the, the, the features that are developed on the tool are especially in the, some of the cutters that we've developed that are really optimized for cutting really well with this new class of product, a handheld CNC machine, mm -hmm. are coming out of developments like, of people, you know, actively using the tools, so. Well, I, we've done webinars with uh, Jake and Noah, and, you know, they're, they're operating a machine, and, and all of a sudden one of them goes, oh, no, that file's on my <laughs> shaper. Yeah, right. or, let, me, let me sync and, or download or, or whatever. Because yeah, yeah. you could tell that they use their personal oh, yeah. shapers all oh, yeah, day yeah, long. Yeah, yeah, yeah. To build things, and um, you know, there you you obviously have great, uh, great people putting a lot of hands on time, and then, not to mention, you've been probably just just as well as any company I can think of, getting this tool in the hands of real life woodworkers consistently, and getting feedback from them. It seems like yeah, that, I mean, you hit the nail on the head. It's not just, I mean. Of course, there's a marketing aspect to that, getting uh, in yeah, the hands sure. of real-world woodworkers. But the most important thing for us is the feedback component. I mean, yeah. the, this is the people who have like earned the, that place in the world. Uh, I mean, pretty consistently, we're working with actual uh, people who are really good at what they do. Philip and Morley. Yeah, exactly. That's a, <laughs> that's a great example. And uh, yeah, I mean. Thankfully, they're also good at keeping secrets because uh, they're a huge part of our development feedback loop. I mean, they, they have early access to the tools that we're developing, both on hardware and software, and they give us a lot of, uh, a lot of critical feedback and tell us where we suck. And uh, yeah, they help to make, make things better. So it's a great part of the process. So the other thing that, that hit today is Adi's baby. Right. <laughs> yes. Yes. Can Can you tell us about uh, Studio? Yeah. Sure. Yeah. So the other product we launched today is Shaper Studio, and uh, you know, I'd say sort of the quick one-liner for Studio is really that it's a simplified 
digital design tool for craftspeople. Um, and so like all of those words, you know, are really important to me, like simple and for craftspeople. You know, a lot of digital design tools, uh, if you ever use CNC or other digital fabrication products, are not necessarily built for that job. Uh, people sort of bend them to their will to get them to work for it. Or, you know, you have maybe really sort of complex 3D CAD modeling tools that are really built for engineers making, engin doing engineering development, you know, uh, and then sort of modify to be like, oh yeah, you want to build some furniture? You can use this too. And the problems really are, one, they have way too many features that you probably don't need. And two, the learning curve is so steep that it inhibits somebody from even starting. Yeah. Um, and so I would say like with, with Origin sort of making CNC accessible, we want to do the same thing for digital design. Uh, you know, it's really something that came out of Origin users' needs for us that people would get the tool, be really excited, and then sort of stumble at the making sort of a complex design that they wanted to build. And they're like, look, I can draw it. I can describe it to you. Why is this so hard to like make this file? Um, and that was always the stumbling block. So, you know, similar to what we were talking about with taking woodworking techniques for plate, um, sort of my hypothesis has always been, how do we take analog design techniques? Like, how does somebody design on a notebook? So that's like really something we looked at, thought about how do I design, how does a woodworker think about laying something out? And how do we take those concepts and put that into like a digital interface? And really sort of like, Simplify it to the point that you just have the things you need, and you know none of the stuff you don't need. And so, um, obviously, we can't you know really bring up and talk about user interface. But uh, when you, I I've seen a version of it yep. um, a while ago. But um, so as somebody who really, not to call out any software, but <laughs> Mike has an Illustrator yep. background. Yep. Um, as an illustrator, and he uses a piece of software every now and then, and he's comfortable with it. Yeah, it's like you said, I use what I learn because I need it for work. Right. And people who design on CAD programs, they do so because they learn CAD for their day job. Right, Yeah. exactly. I have no experience with those programs. And so when I try and make an SVG file, I am forced to use a program that is not designed to do what I need it to do. It's designed to do incredible things. Yeah, what an that, illustrator needs. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah, yeah. And so I always hit a, a real stumbling block right. anytime I try and make uh, a, a vector file or an SVG file or, or whatever. And when I was shown um, Studio, it really, I mean, I guess I'm going to simplify what I saw sure. a lot. There was like squares. There was circles, there was ovals. And here's the square, that's the beginning of the shape. Here's an oval, subtract this corner of the oval away from that square. The way that a, a sketch artist might, or a woodworker might use a French curve and a ruler and a square, these are the simple shapes that we're used to. Yep. And you use them in an additive fashion and you use them in a subtractive fashion on the program. And it really was like, a, oh man, this is right. what we've needed. Right. Yeah. yeah, totally. I mean, I think, you know, uh, you mentioned, Mike, that it was like you had the experience with Illustrator because you were an illustrator and you were able to use those tools. I think of this as like coming to me now, but the tool we really want to build is for people who have experience describing what they want to design in analog and sketching, right? And that's the experience you have. So you're like, I have the skill set. Why is this not translating into what I, how I design this? And so that's really the tool we want to build and you know, we see it growing into for sure. So what is, I mean, how long have you been working on Studio? Too long. Wow. <laughs> not, not long enough, Joe, is the right answer. <laughs> the CEO, CEO <laughs> comment right there. Uh, no, I've been, I, th I would say, we probably, I started working on a studio uh, almost two years ago, okay. uh, is like sort of the birth of the idea. Um, you know, like I, we were talking about where I started to shape, I just started doing mechanical engineering and then sort of really 
went into this because it was like, I, we saw the problem, we would talk about it a lot, and then I sort of make it a personal mission because I was like, this is something that I want and I need, and I know 3D CAD, and yeah. I know Illustrator, and I still am just like, those are not tools for the job. Yeah. Uh, and so it really started as like a small group, it was just me and another engineer uh, working on this together for a while. We proved the idea out internally, um, you know, if you're in the Some things work a lot, by the way. If you, if you, if you're an employee, sorry to Very cut in, Audi, but if you got this group of passionate employees who are also users of tools, and if if you have this idea that you really want to come to life, I mean, usually the conversation goes like, "Hey, I've got this idea," and I'll say, "Hey, go prototype it. Let's see if it's got any legs," and then we go. So yeah, it's always start small and then you know snowball. Yeah. Sorry. Yeah. Exactly. So you know, started as that, and then snowballed a little bit, and then we were like. Uh, we actually were like, okay, we probably need to test this at a larger scale than even just talking to a few customers. And so we actually launched sort of a version of this that were under the banner labs where we're trying sort of experimental things with our community. And so we just released it to Origin customers. Um, and that's been out, I think, a year now. Uh, so it's been a year in development and, ex and experimenting with things, getting a ton of feedback from the community. And we sort of took all that feedback. We've been working you know, on, on all these features for a while and sort of graduating that into the product mm -hmm. that we're calling Shaper Studio. Uh, and you know, we definitely see that we'll continue to do that you know, with the community getting feedback. And one of the critical things I think we learned as we were doing this, originally the idea was like for origin users uh, and for uh, origin customers, but like more and more as we talk to people, I talk to my mom, my mom owns a Cricut vinyl cutter, uh -huh. and it's the same problems. It's like, it's a digital fabrication tool, how do I design the thing to yeah. fabricate? Uh, and so really, we realize it's really a, you know, a design problem for all digital fabrication users, really for the real world, and that's sort of the intention is like, design for real world things, not design that you know lives on or web page or lives in the digital world. Yeah. So, yeah. Well, okay, but so you you said web page. It is a web-based interface, yep. right? That's right. Yep. And it ties to the shaper magically? Like That's, yeah. Yes. It it's, yeah, basically it's, magic. It's, yeah, software magic. It's yeah. unicorn sneezes yep. and and okay. Yeah, I mean, honestly, <laughs> a lot of time uh, the stuff we do is magic to me too, so. Uh <laughs> It is, um, yeah, so you just, all you need is a Shaper account, the same account you would have set up for, you know, an origin and get access to the files online. Well, or if you're not even an origin owner or now. Or not even if you're an origin owner account. now. You sign can up, get on that just, email list. Yeah. That's right, yeah. <laughs> oh, no, sign up for Shaker and you actually get, you will get access to Studio and get to use it for free. Mm -hmm. uh, there's a free tier of the tool. Um, but yeah, as you mentioned, there's a direct link to origin. So, you know, if you own an origin and you're using Studio, there, there's not, none of this like pressing buttons Again, because we're not like, hey, you should know how to use a computer. Remember to hit Command S or Control S to save it. Just work on the thing, and you're like, okay, let me go check on it. And you go on Origin, it's already there. Go test test a cut. Maybe that didn't work. Go back, make a modification. Already on tool. Wow. Yeah, and the fact that it's in a web browser means even what Adi just described is he could have been working on your laptop to do the design, but as you're at the tool, you could actually break out your phone, open up the same file that you were working on, and make the modification right there and send it directly back to the tool. Yeah. So you don't have to go back to you know the original source that you were working on. So you can actually, wow. Yep, you can so actually. So you, you could be at the bench. Piece, clamp down, let me make that a 64th of an inch larger so that the inlay fits better or something like that. Yep, Go. absolutely. Just do modifications on your phone. I mean, again, same, similar to the, you know, what what do people actually need? You know, they don't, they don't need a software company telling them to buy a specific computer, you know, that only works on Windows 90, whatever, 2000. I don't even know <laughs> See, what Windows, Windows is on 96? anymore. Windows 96? I don't even know what Windows is on anymore. <laughs> Get that uh, special version. But, you know, it's... A uh, web-based tool, any device that can open a browser, you can use it on. Mm -hmm. um, or any modern device, I should say, that can open a browser. Uh, I'm going to get complaints from people using devices from 1995. Is, uh, but, uh, is it supported with AltaVista? <laughs> <laughs> or Netscape? Netscape, <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah, but yeah, again, yeah, because you know, you're, you're in your workshop. I don't want my computer in my workshop. I have a computer in my workshop. It's in my phone. Yeah. 
uh, yeah. and it should be able to do the things I want to do. So you had shown me the booklet with a number of different commercially available hinges. Oh, Those right. Two-stage inset hinges, which yeah. are insanely impossible to install. Yeah. Is that part of this it's a little program bit, as well? So they're, they're, they're kind of all interrelated, so yeah. it's difficult to tell where one ends and one begins. But it's not technically part of a studio. That's technically part of... Uh, and what we consider our back end called Shaper Hub. Shaper Hub and you know, rewinding back in time, Shaper Hub has existed since Origin has existed. And we always knew that we wanted to have kind of a, a, a repository of published content. And the content was coming from us, from Shaper, you know, things that we had developed, things that we were doing in the shop, uh, furniture designs, et cetera. But also importantly, from the community of users. So uh, we try to make it really easy for if you've designed something that you're cutting with Origin, that you can upload it into Shaper Hub at your account. And you can, you can decide whether you're sh you know, sharing that publicly with other people in the community, or if you're keeping that privately to yourself, just to use on the tool. So Shaper Hub has existed since Origin is, has existed in the market. But, it, but like Origin, uh, it continues to evolve over time. And you know, some, some time ago, at least a year ago, I, I guess, we started really focusing, and this is, you know, in hindsight now, this is in anticipation, especially of Plate coming out, recognition that with Plate, uh, you know, for years we've been talking about how Origin can be used to, to install uh, hardware, things like hinges, door pulls, you know, all, all the, the myriad of, of hardware you can imagine. But, but uh, speaking quite honestly, in reality, while it's possible with Origin, it's a little bit cumbersome. You have to be creative in your fixturing and your setup and your balance of, okay, how do you get this just right in your alignment, maybe even the layout of the tape and the scanning. It's definitely possible, and we, you can, we do it every day. But there's got to be a better way. And so when Plate was coming out, we recognized this is the game changer for uh, the, the like localized precision cutting and uh, really puts the spotlight on things like hardware installation. So we started really investing uh, internally in building out what we call hardware catalogs. So this, is, this is, resides within Shaper Hub. Uh, it's a digital catalog uh, and it contains what we consider the most popular hardware, uh, hardware pieces that we see people using, you know, actively using in furniture builds, cabinet shops. And it grows over time. So we have people, people on board. It's a, it's a really important philosophy for us that everything that we produce in that hardware catalog is actually perfectly designed to operate really, really well. Look, we recognize that usually when you're installing, it's, this is not practice anymore. You know, you've got this expensive piece of yeah. Clara walnut that you're putting the finishing touch on. You better not mess it up. So we actually uh, vet uh, we, we design the files and all the specific manufacturer recommendations for the you know, offset from the edge mm -hmm. and everything. We bake that into the file and uh, test it, physically test it, and test the fits and everything before we publish it to the hardware catalog. I don't know the exact number now. We're up in the you know, hundred and a half uh, hardware items and, and growing, I growing. Mean, there's some very, very popular. I mean, there's yeah. sauce hinges, I know. Yeah, and, yeah. I mean, you, Mike is actually right yeah. next to a few of them. The Leche, um, Siemens Work, uh, Sauce, you named uh, the classics, you know, Blum, all the Euro cup hinges, things like that. But all stuff, stuff that's quite difficult to cut. <laughs> and um, that looks like a pain. The, yeah, <laughs> it really yeah. does. And Mike, what you were referring to earlier, though, we were excited. We were actually showing this off at IWF for the first time. So this has been this digital content that lives out there. But again, coming back to uh, a little bit of like just recognition of maybe the workflow. Okay, I'll just speak for myself. Look, I'm a physical print person, and in, like you know, when I'm working in the workshop, yeah, cool. I've got this digital catalog. I know I can reference. It's easy to find on the phone. It's easy to do. It's easy to search for. That's all nice. But sometimes I just like to, you know, flip through a, a physical printed catalog and uh, see what I'm dealing with, and like, hey, yeah, yeah, that's the, the actual hinge I want. Or just take the time. You've got the hinge package. Uh, oh yeah, that's the part number. Look it up in the catalog. Yep, we got it. And um, what we think is really cool. Now we have this physical printed catalog. You have one in your hand, and uh, you can on each page of the catalog. It actually has a QR code that you can just you know, grab your phone, pull out the camera, and instantly go into Shaper Hub, into the hardware catalog, and find that exact hinge. And 
Yes, indeed, there is a button that says sync to origin. And uh -huh. assuming that you're logged into your account on your tool uh, and on your phone, and you hit this, it magically, you know, automatically appears and ready to cut. And so combine this together with plate, combine this together with things that you've made on Studio, tying this back together to your original yeah. question. I mean, these things all kind of end up blending together, but that's hopefully right. what we're going for here. So Hub is basically a library you're leveraging of company created and crowdsourced stuff right. and studios a creative space in which exactly, to design exactly. your own yeah. stuff? The thread that connects them really is the file format. Yeah. So it's called SVG. They're all SVG. That's what Studio um, operates in and that's what you can download. Yeah. And you know, if you didn't have, for example, you know, we didn't have maybe a specific file for like maybe a cast iron hinge or something that you found somewhere or a really old thing, that's something you can easily design in Studio. So okay. a lot yeah. of the hardware files, you can you can also design those in Studio. You can also use Studio to actually lay out these hardware files. You can also do that directly on Tool, obviously. Uh, and so it's all, yeah. Or like the, the, lay out your cabinet door and yeah, mark exactly. where you want to put your hinges and then, you know. The, 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 what you download from Hub, though, does that already have the depths and everything in it? So it's not strictly an SVG file, right? It's SVG based. Because SVG is more of a 2D thing, right? Yeah. I don't know. <laughs> so that, it's, a, it's, a, it's a deep, I guess, technical question in terms of what is the file format. But yes, SVG is a 2, is a 2D file format. Um, the hardware files actually just, they annotate the depth on them. And okay. so you can just read okay. them on. Okay. The on origin, and so okay. when you you go over them, it's sort of just marked in there, and you can read it off. Cool. Yeah. All right. Cool. Very cool. Right on. So I think one of the I have a million questions. Um, so one of them, in terms of at the magazine, um, we deal with people who have been woodworking for half their lives or more. We have other people just coming into the craft. So uh, in terms of this machine, I could see how does it fit someone like myself who's been woodworking for thirty years in terms of what is there for me to interest me in adapting this into my workflow. I mean, I think there's tons. And then there's also the question of someone coming into the craft who doesn't necessarily know from shaper to a table saw how to cut a mortise and tenon, but I'm coming here and this can cut this, so I'm just adapting this tool. I'm comfortable with tech, I'm comfortable with my iPhone. Yeah. And, and so this is just a natural progression of sort of the culture that I'm coming from. Right. Who do you see as your your primary audience right now? Is it both? Is Bo it both of those? Those okay. are two. You've described you know almost two ends of a spectrum. Yeah. Right. And so I'll, I'll take I'll take the first one you mentioned first. So like somebody like you, I don't actually know you all that well, but like you you self described as uh, uh, being on that toward that end of the spectrum. So what we what we hope is that like I think there's we just zoom out. Let's not talk about woodworking for a second. I think most of us can agree, uh, whether we like it or not, you know, digital products have kind of changed, fundamentally changed their lives. So, and I'm not going to sit here and you know, be the spouse how great that is. I mean, there's the good and the bad that comes with that. But look, it's it's certainly we recognize it's easy to pull out the phone and you know, whatever, navigate through maps or you know, whatever you've chosen today to to help your life. So I think people can kind of step back and recognize, all right, digital, digital tools, digital techniques have a place and they have helped me in other areas of my life. I think what we would hope is that people could, could like recognize that like, all right, can there be a place for this in my uh, workflow in, in the woodworking world? And I think for a lot of people, the answer is yes. And, and they already think and know the answer is yes. But when you kind of look out into the world, there's this really big chasm or jump to, to you know, walk around the show floor today. And like you mentioned earlier, there's these giant machines. Um, frankly, it's pretty intimidating. Not, not just the physical size of the machine, but just like, where do you begin? I mean, all the things that Adi was just talking about, like these CAD tools and stuff like that. I mean, that's just the beginning of learning to operate a machine like that. And look, they have their place. We have gantry-based CNC machines in our house, uh, in our shop. In our house. <laughs> it's because Joe lives at work. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's true. Uh, anyway, look, those have their place, but these are these are big, big, big jumps, and and um, for a lot of people, and I, understandably, that's a jump people are maybe unwilling to take, or just like, I don't need it that bad, or I don't want it that bad, or you know, or maybe I want to, you know, actively 
repel against that because I don't want to make that big of a leap. I don't want to learn CAD. I don't want to learn CAD. I don't want to learn, you know, tool pathing. I don't want to. I don't want to spend like two years getting good at this thing that I might use occasionally. Right. Whatever. So, coming back to your question, hopefully, you know, somebody would look at this. Somebody with a lot of years of experience and with maybe a hint that they would like some of these, the capabilities of what a digital workflow can bring to them, you know, we could be a bridging operation for them that, that kind of, you know, meets them somewhere in the middle and, you know, extends a hand out to say, come on board, like, it's not as intimidating as you think. And, you know, I think a lot of people say that, like, hey, we make CNC easy. And I think that a lot of companies are striving to do that. But let's just take all those buzzwords out of it and just say, like, what, do you, what are you actually trained to do? What do you know how to do? And right. where can you just, like, you know, start wading into these waters? And, like, I think we're a really good, a very good entry point for somebody like you. Um, now, let's go to the other end. Let's say somebody who has never done any woodworking, but they're, we, we call them digital native, right? Somebody who it's very natural for them. Um, it's really interesting, actually, at something like a trade show like this, because... If we just grabbed you know, a kid walking by that's walking by with their family and said, jump on this, I don't even have to say a word about how to do that. They're going to know how to operate this tool already. I don't know, some kind of like baked-in intuition about how to, how to navigate the, you know, the screen and everything. Uh, so it comes really naturally. And I think for that one, we have a, a bridge in the different direction, which is like, how do I connect together these, what, what is actually there? real normal world, which might be digital first. Yeah. How do I like bridge into mm -hmm. this physical world and hopefully develop, I mean, not just for the sake of like, isn't that cute or quaint, but hopefully seriously develop, uh, you know, a real connection to making physical things, working with their hands and, and experience materiality uh, in a way that, that, you know, maybe some of us have, have, known and appreciated for uh, a big portion of our lives yeah. and it, you know maybe it's a, a rich part of the human experience as well so that i think i think it comes from both directions i i i consider myself like one foot in both of those camps and i do i do 3d printing i have you know i built a cnc kit that's got dust on it um <laughs> you know all sorts of stuff but shaper is one of those things that it's not going to take up a third of my shop, you know. Um, you, it's incredibly versatile. And, in fact, the, one of the first things I thought of um, when I saw Plate and Studio was, like, crafts fairs. Oh, yeah. You can, you can take this tool with you and personalize a cutting board right. for an added fee. And... There you go. I love there's, it. There's Business a in whole, a box right there's there. There's a whole yeah. new market. And this, like this is, it's bringing something that, that, that was relegated to a corner of a dusty shop that needed, you know, a massive three horsepower dust collector to, to operate at one point to, you just stick it in your van and, right. and maybe pull in an extra couple hundred bucks. Right. Personalizing things. Maybe let the person engrave it themselves. Oh. Is that easy? Oh. <laughs> yeah. Oh. You know? Then they want a discount because <laughs> they did it themselves. <laughs> well, I thank you so much. I, we took up more of your time than. than I'm not. But, I'm not done. Okay, no, all right, I'm, all right. I'm just kidding. We can. Yeah, no, <laughs> it, we, I, I mean, it just we just kind of got going. It's such an interesting story, and I just appreciate you taking the time yeah. and oh. telling us. And yeah, well, the pleasure was uh, pleasure was all ours. Yeah, it was I'll ours, speak yeah. Variety. <laughs> I, I actually, do I have? Sure, a minute? go for okay. it. You're the boss. No, I did want to say because uh, the point was. And this is where some people might, might balk at it. It's like, oh, a mortise and tenon, I can do that automatically. Like, where's the challenge in that? But for myself, in teaching woodworking and designing and, and building, this notion of if all of my bandwidth goes towards learning how to cut a dovetail, then this piece I made is about that joint. But the more experienced I am, the easier it is to cut that the less it becomes about that, and it's about designing around it. So the easier you're, you're allowing people to make things, really, the more emphasis you're able to place on designing. It's like, yeah, usually you can make this joint, but what are you making with it? Where are you putting it? Yeah. What, what are you doing with it? And then I think you talk about augmentation. 
It's like, yeah, we're making this part easier so you can invest your energies into the really cool, fun stuff. I think that's right. awesome. I think that's a really interesting point. And this is, um, we've heard different versions of this. Sometimes, sometimes I describe it as like, you know, choose your battle or choose your passion yeah, about wh exactly. whatever you care yeah. about there. I mean, yep. so for some, I, I hear it and not only hear, but I understand that criticism and it's a real one of like, well, but that's not the same as a hand cut thing. You know, I think uh, I don't want to miss quote uh, Philip Morley on this, but I think he, you know, he's mentioned a he couple of- He won't remember it anyway. <laughs> <laughs> I think he's mentioned a couple times, he's like, hey, look, I don't have to prove to anybody that I can cut that dovetail by hand. I know I can, and like everybody knows I can. Like, I'm here to make money and get S done. And uh, I've got a, you know, a more efficient way to do this. Uh, if he needs to apply some hand touch love on areas to do things, he will. He, he can and he will. And I think this is a, a good example of that. I think I still, I also think people who, are passionate about, for example, let's just stick to that example, a hand cut dovetail mm -hmm. can remain passionate about that. Sure. And also, it's it's such an interesting thing, and this is this is no BS. Uh, look, it's very easy for a total novice to come in and pick this up, but it is not automatic, and there is technique. I guarantee you that you, Mike, as this, you know, three, three plus decade uh, experienced operator of tools will outshine me on techniques of using origin uh, pretty quickly, like within a day, because you've just got so much accumulated, you know, technique and knowledge of, you know, material and grain and, and you know, like feeds and speeds and just how, how it works that like all that former knowledge is uh, that accumulated knowledge, not, I shouldn't say former accumulated knowledge is really applicable to even yeah. what we're doing here. That's so a great this point. isn't just, it's very, very different from other types of things, you know, for better and worse. It's not just push a button and walk away and then, you know, it magically comes off the 3D printer and yes. it's done. I mean, there's, there's, a, there's a technique to this. Yeah, and that's the same argument, like hand and machine, you know. Yeah. People say, oh, uh, machine work is automatic and hand work takes finesse and skill. It's like, no, machine work takes creativity, finesse, and skill in order to put this machine to use. And this is just another machine. And when I was looking at it, I wasn't thinking, oh, I don't have to learn how to do this anymore, this anymore. It was just from a creative standpoint, oh, wow, this just... Yeah, what is it? What does it free your mind up to yeah. be able to like, take it to the next level? When we first came out with this, this is what I remember having when we first we're, you know, putting Origin out into the market. I remember having like a team meeting where we're saying like, we think, I'm sure there's a lot of us in the room that think that we've done everything they can. I mean, this is just the beginning. We're gonna get this out there into the world and people are gonna, experts, like seriously skilled craftspeople are gonna put this in their hands and take this to the next level. So that's, that's maybe my bigger, biggest counter to like, oh, you know, if ever, anybody's ever approaching this like, I don't like this thing because I've worked 20 years to uh, uh, accumulate these skills, I'd like to just say, this is awesome. Please take this and do next level stuff with it that we couldn't have been able to do. Your, like, your 20 <laughs> years of, of skill and expertise will yeah. make Shaper better. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Pop, yeah. pop it to the next level. Yeah. This sounds great. Yeah. 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 I mean, I think about this a lot for my personal work. Of You know, I just, I like making things. I like designing things. And I'm always constantly thinking about how the tools I use like constrain my thinking and constrain what I even believe to be possible, right? Mm -hmm. Like if you design things in 3D CAD, maybe you're designing them based on what's available to you. You design things for hand cutting, you're designing things based on the techniques you know. And I think with every tool, sort of the hope is that it unleashes some different part of unlock something else. And I think you can think of Origin in the same way and the tools we build in the same way. It just like unlocks more things and hopefully unlocks completely new things. It's not unlocking the same things at a different price or same things for harder to learn. Right. It's just unlocking a completely new different capability. And so you can cut hand cut dovetail, dovetails and then, you know, cut the hinge on that cabinet also. Oh, every yeah. day. I'm gonna route that sucker out now. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Choose your battles. Yeah. <laughs> cool. Well, that does it for this episode of Shop Talk Live. Again, thank you so much to Adi and Joe for coming on the show. And we were going to do a half an hour episode with them. And 
we just got going and it was a really fun discussion. We enjoyed it. If you have any questions about Shaper Origin, head on over to their website and check out all of the new things that they're adding to the line. It's, it's pretty cool. It's a very exciting product. It's a very exciting time to see this technology in woodworking. And like they said, to see the technology become transparent and just a part of woodworking. So if you have any questions you'd like answered on the show, send them into shoptalk at taunt.com. If you're watching on YouTube, please click that thumbs up button. We'll be back in two weeks with another episode. Thanks for listening.